Hi, I'm Pastor Tom Rice from Cranford Alliance Church, and I want to thank you for tuning in to watch a portion of our Sunday worship service. You know, at Cranford Alliance, we are a Christ-centered family that is seeking, growing, and going. We are seeking God's presence, we are growing God's people, and we are going with God's love to our neighbors and to the world. If you'd like to find out more, you can find us on the web at cranfordalliance.org, our Facebook page, or even our YouTube channel. Now I pray that you'll be encouraged by the message that you hear. Again, thank you, and God bless you. Okay, very good. I want to invite Dave to come on up as, as he introduces our Grief Share member. Let's give Dave some encouragement. Good morning. Um, welcome. Today is Grief Share Sunday. It's been a little while since we've had a, uh, one of these, <clears throat> so if you're relatively new, you may not have heard you know, what this is all about. Um, so what is Grief Share? Uh, Grief Share is a grief recovery support group. And um, I'd like to thank Lisa Brennan for starting a ministry here after going through the program at another church. Uh, she had suffered back-to-back -back losses and was seeking help, and she went to, uh, I think it was Evangel. <clears throat> and after going through that, she approached me and asked me if the elders would consider starting that here. And uh, that was 12 years ago. And uh, Lisa led it for many years before moving to South Jersey and passed the torch to me. Um, today we're going to hear from Diane Ellis, who's uh, from our last group, but before I call her up, I want to re recognize a few others. I want to thank Mary Newman. Uh, who's, she's been coordinating our bakers and um, the others who bring goodies for you guys on Thursday nights. She's the one responsible for that, so thank you. Uh, we appreciate that, Mary. And thank you to all who have been a faithful part of this ministry as far as providing that stuff. In Matthew 25, 40, Jesus tells us that whatever you do for the least of these, you do also for me. So, you know, bear that in mind when you're, when you're preparing things. Or sometimes it may be a hassle. You know, maybe you're, you're crazy busy and you're rushing to try and get something here or bake or whatever. But just know that, that you're doing it not just for these people, but for the Lord. So I want to thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> it means a lot to these people who come. So... Um, I also want to thank um, Madeline and Maggie and Deb for their faithful dedication and service as facilitators in this ministry. Madeline, I believe, is in her 11th year. And that, that's dedication. Let's, let's give her a hand clap. <laughs> you know, she, she's not even from this church, and she's already dedicated 11 years to this. So I think that's amazing. I really appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> thank you as a church for your prayerful support. Uh, last but not least, I want to thank the people from the group who came out to support Daniel, uh, Diane. I know she appreciates it, and so do I. And let's give them a hand clap, too. Thank you, guys. <clears throat> um, at this time, I'd like to bring Diane up to share what's on her heart and how the ministry has impacted her. So please give her a warm welcome. Hi, so I'm Diane Ellis, and I first came to Cranford Alliance um, Grief Share Group in September of 2018. Um, I read in the paper about a grief share journey, and I thought, oh, I don't know. Is this the right thing? Should I do this? Will it help? So I said, okay, just call up, give your name, and give it a try. And the first time I came, I felt this was something I could relate to, something I could learn from, something that would help me. And uh, I've learned five years down the road, it's still helping me. I'm still learning. I actually just, in, when I came five years ago, I had just lost my husband three months before. But today, as I stand in front of you, the day after Christmas, I lost a close cousin of mine suddenly. And my grief shared journey of all my learning each Thursday, watching a video, using my workbook, discussions, just talking with people, hearing their grief, helping each other, 
I've made so many friends and I've gotten so much deeper in my faith of reading the Bible, of scripture, of going to Bible study classes at my church. Um, it's all a growing experience. We're always learning. And it's also made me so conscious that God is with each one of us from beginning till the end. He's always with us through hard times and good times. And we always have to remember that, remember the good times, even with the sad times, always being thankful. And um, it's just been amazing for me and Mary, the, the generosity of all the baking and making us all feel so welcome. And it's, it's beautiful that this church provides this. I recommend it to anyone that I come across and they've just lost someone, that it's a tremendous, tremendous blessing and help. And uh, most of the people I've met here, I never saw them before in my life and never would have, but that's how God works. He got me to meet all of you and you to meet me. And uh, it's beautiful. I'm not, I'm not even looking at all this stuff I wrote down because I wrote pages and tore it up and wrote pages. Because when you've learned so much, there's a lot to tell, a lot of stories. And um, I did learn this with Grief Share. When you go there, you're in such grief but the people around you, you're hearing their grief and you're actually crying more for them because you're feeling their pain. And actually this last sessions of the grief share, I came back because Madeline told me it was a new program, a new workbook, a new video. And I thought, I'm gonna come back. It could be something more for me to learn. And I did and it was good. And finally, this session of 13 weeks, I noticed all the new people in the beginning when they came, how really sad, how just distraught. And I could see as the weeks went by, they were smiling again. They were laughing. Yes, they were still sad. But when you hear the grief share people say, I'm so happy to be here. This means so much. It's, it's heartwarming. To me, it's worth everything. And uh, thank you to Dave, Madeline, Maggie, and we had Arlene, I remember, and there was a Lady D and Deb. Um, just your generosity and caring and just the faithfulness of just being, and you've been amazing no matter what, and uh, I thank you. I think that's it. Okay, thank you, thank you, it's my pleasure. Hallelujah. All right. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Um, you know, the Bible says that God is close to the brokenhearted. That is the truth. God is very close to the brokenhearted. And if God is close to them, then we should be too. Amen. And I love how Grief Share does that. And indeed, to come alongside and amen. I remember when I went through grief share, that same, that same sort of sense of, right, it's about journeying through your grief and noticing, too, just how the Spirit of God just works. So praise the Lord. Amen. 
Uh, as we continue on our worship, uh, brothers and sisters, if you have your Bibles, please turn in them to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2, that's the first book in the New Testament. If you don't have your own Bible, you can grab the blue one in front of you, and it's page 966. 966 in the Blue Pew Bible, Matthew chapter 2. Uh, for those of you that may not be aware, today is, we're still in Christmas season. So Merry Christmas! <laughs> it's the seventh day of Christmas. My true love gave to me. No, okay. Uh, but truly, it is the seventh day of Christmas. Uh, and so with that in mind, uh, you know, I don't know if, if many people know this, but actually in some other cultures, uh, Epiphany Day or Three Kings Day is actually a, a much bigger deal even than Christmas. Uh, even in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, that's actually going to be January 6th, uh, which is a Saturday. Uh, and so I thought today we'll focus in on those quote-unquote three kings, uh, if you will. So Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. Praise the Lord. Uh, before we uh, read, will you pray with me, please? Let us pray. Father, we thank you for, again, uh, this opportunity that we have to gather together to worship you on this final day of 2023. Lord, we thank you for Diane and for the courage, Lord, that uh, she had to come up here and to share how you've been at work in her life uh, and how, Lord, how she's journeyed and how you have worked and brought about new life and joy and peace. And God, we pray that you would continue to work there. We pray your blessing over Diane. We pray your blessing over every grief share guest here today. Uh, and Lord, now as we open up your word, make us alive to your word. God, we believe that your word is alive. It is holy. It is active. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. And that by the power of your spirit, Lord, you can speak to us today. And so give us ears to hear. Give us a heart, Lord, to feel and a mind to understand, Lord, what you would have for each one of us. God, I pray that even if we came today and, you know, we're not even sure why we're here or, or maybe we just came out of routine or maybe we just, uh, God, I pray that you would fill us with expectation now that you have a word for each one of us. And now, Spirit of the Sovereign Lord, be upon us all and anoint us to hear the good news. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay. Matthew chapter 2, starting in verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written, quote, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh and having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod they returned to their country by another route may God add his blessing to the reading of his word amen amen a familiar story I'm sure for many of us right and again good old Carol right we three kings of Orient are well first of all 
I hate to burst bubbles here, but they weren't really kings. Magi just kind of means they were like wise men. They, they, were, they were learned guys, probably from what we would consider modern-day Iraq. And so they, they weren't Jewish. And one of the most uh, significant things about this story uh, that I, don't, I definitely don't want us to miss is that this was to fulfill prophecy. And even in the call to worship, I don't know if you heard that in Isaiah 65 when I read it to us, but right there in the beginning, it was talking about that, that all the nations would come and worship Jesus. And this is a foreshadowing of that, if you will, because here you had wise men from the east, modern-day Iraq, if you will. And so they studied the stars. They studied scriptures, not just their own, but again, Jewish scriptures and all these. They studied the stars. And right, they, they had these sort of superstitions, if you will, and they saw this sort of royal star appear and said, hey, looks like a new king has been born in Jerusalem. So uh, another thing I, I want to just give us a frame of reference real quick. I know, right, most of the, I know most of the images we see, right, and again, when we sing we three kings, it wasn't just three of them. It was probably a whole convoy, right? It, it was probably a whole bunch of them. And, and the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh, yeah, that makes us think of three. But more than likely, it was probably a lot. A lot of gold, a lot of frankincense, and a lot of myrrh. Gifts fit for a king, because that's where they were coming. And again, as they were traveling from, from that area of what we would call modern-day Iraq to this day, it was probably a journey of about, you know, maybe 30 to 40 days' worth of journeying. Right? They didn't have planes back then. You know, they didn't have cars, <laughs> right? So, so uh, imagine this now. Here they came all the way, right, from, from, from modern-day Iraq, traveling probably 30 to 40 days. So it was probably, like I said, a whole envoy, a whole convoy, if you will, of, 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 these, of these guys uh, with their servants and all this stuff. And, and of course, that's, that's why when we read here in Matthew 2, when it says, they, they were thinking automatically, well, if a new king uh, of the Jews has been born, where do you go? Well, you go to the capital, right? And, that, and that's why they went to King Herod and say, hey, where's the, where's the king of the Jews, the new king? And, you know, and then when it says King Herod was disturbed and all of Jerusalem with him, this must have been a pretty big convoy of, of guys come to visit. So now that I've kind of set the stage for us a little bit of context, just a couple quick things that I want to to, 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 uh, to learn from this story. And again, like I said, I really do believe that even a story like this, which we've heard over and over and over again, probably for many of us, or maybe not, maybe we're hearing it for the first time, but we can actually learn some things from this for today, for our lives today. And so uh, again, uh, please, if something strikes you, listen to it. Point number one is this. To start the new year, let us leave behind that which keeps us from seeking Jesus. As we start the new year, right, tomorrow, new year, I, I remember uh, seeing uh, on my social media feed, someone said, um, you know, my, if I could um, give an illustration of what my new year's resolution would be, he said, for the first two weeks, it's going to be a gym. And then after that, it's going to turn into a bar. <laughs> right, right. Everyone, you, know, you make these promises at the beginning of the new year, these new year's resolutions. I'm going to do something new. Right. So, yeah, so I am tapping into that a little bit. But, right, again, new year, new promises, right, new hope, new, right, new horizons. So let's think about this. As we enter 2024, what are some things that you want to leave behind from 2023? And I'm saying that in the context of seeking Jesus. Because here's the thing, when we hear about this story, and like I said, uh, th this is what I love about uh, you know, reading the Bible and, and kind of digging into it a little bit further. Like I said, in order for these magi to come all the way to find Jesus, they had to leave everything they knew that was familiar. They had to leave their home country. They had, they had to leave behind everything that was comfortable. They had to leave behind everything that, you know, that, 
that was part of their, of, of their, of their normal, everyday life in order to go seek after Jesus. They had to leave it behind. They had to be willing to leave behind all the comfort of home. They had to be willing. And again, like I said, this isn't just a, a journey of a day or two. This is a journey of like a month and more. And again, right, uh, traveling back then, the, you know, the roads, you know, it may be dangerous, all this other stuff. You know, no, they resolved. Hey, we saw something in the sky. We're not exactly sure what it means, but we're going to go. And so they left everything behind. They left everything, like I said, that was comfortable, that was familiar, that was known. They left it behind in order to seek after Jesus. And so with that in mind, brothers and sisters, what do you need to leave behind? this year, as we enter into the next. What do you need to leave behind? What do you need to let go of? What do you need to put off? Even if it's familiar. Even if it's comfortable. Even if it feels like home. Is there something you need to leave behind in order to seek after Jesus? And now I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a little... Um, I'm going to get a little preachy now. Is there unforgiveness that you need to leave behind? Is there bitterness that you need to leave behind? Is there a relationship that needs to be repaired? And here, here's the thing, brothers and sisters. In order to seek after Jesus, in order to follow Jesus, if I may say this, it does take trust and faith. And, I, and you know, like I said, I, I mentioned the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday is coming up soon. I love this quote by him. Faith is taking the first step even when you don't see the whole staircase. And just like these magi, right? They, they, right? They, they didn't know what they were going to get into. But they were convinced, hey, we need to go find this newborn king. But they had to leave things behind. And so um, I, I want to ask you and me today, brothers and sisters, what do you need to leave behind? Worry, doubt, Anxiety, again, all of these major things that keep us from fully experiencing the life that God intends. That keeps us from seeking after Jesus. And can I just say, you know, and I get it, right? The, the fear of the unknown, the fear, I don't know what's going to happen if I try to, to, to reach out with this fractured relationship I don't know what's going to happen if I, if, if, if I try to offer uh, grace and forgiveness. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen. Okay, but here's the thing, brothers and sisters. We believe there is a God who does know. I'm kind of reminded of um, uh, the famous speech by King George VI. Has, has, has anyone ever seen uh, the movie The King's Speech? Right? Um, uh, great movie. I, I highly recommend it. it it's, it's based off of um, King George VI. He's actually the father of Queen Elizabeth. And after, after his dad died and his older brother abdicated the right to the throne, he became king. But he had a speech impediment. And that's what the King's Speech movie is all about. It's really cool. But um, in his Christmas message in 1939... He gave a speech, right? And of course, back in the day, it was over the radio. So how you spoke obviously meant a lot. But in his 1939 Christmas message, right, to the people of England, now you have to think about what was going on in 1939, right? Germany was invading Poland. They were, on, they were, they, they were under threat of war. They, everyone basically was, uh-oh, war is about to start. And of course, World War II was going to start in full swing. 
And here's King George VI in his 1939 Christmas message. I love what he said. Everyone's worried. Everyone's anxious. Oh, no, what's going to happen? And I love what he said. He, he cited a poem uh, about, I, I, I said to the man at the gate of the year, give me a light that I may go out into the unknown. And the man at the gate of the year said unto me, go out into the darkness and put your hand in God's hand, and it will be to you better than the light and safer than the known. That when we know that we put our hand in God's hand, it's better than the light and safer than the known. And so I want to encourage you. What do you need to leave behind? Because like I said, if you don't, then it keeps you from seeking after Jesus. To start the new year, let's leave behind that which keeps us from seeking Jesus. That sin that can so easily beset us, like we're told about in Hebrews. Let's cast it off and run that race that's been marked out for you and for me. What is it, brothers and sisters, that you need to leave behind? Point number two. When we stop seeking Jesus, we stop growing and sacrifice the wrong things. When we stop seeking Jesus, we stop growing and sacrifice the wrong things. Now, I mentioned it earlier, right? Our mission statement is seeking, growing, going. Let me hear you say seeking. Seeking, seeking God's presence. There is nothing on earth like the holy presence of God. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like being in the room and, and, and sensing God's presence. There's nothing like seeking after his presence. Nothing, nothing. I tell you, like, you know, as we were worshiping with music there for a moment and we were singing worthy, I, I don't know about you, but I felt the presence of God. There's nothing like it. We were created to worship to seek after Jesus. But here's the thing, brothers and sisters. When we stop seeking, we stop growing. And, and I, I, this is another thing, and, and forgive me if you've heard me say this before, but I, I believe this is so, so important. And we're forgetful people. <laughs> so I'm saying it again if you're saying, oh, I've heard you say this a million times, Pastor. Did you notice that the Magi, okay, they came to Jerusalem all because all they saw was a star in the sky. And they, and they were like, okay, it's, 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 it's in that, that part of the hemisphere, and it must mean that there's a new king in, in, in Israel, so that's where we're going to go. They didn't know exact, all the exact details. And so, of course, right, they come to King Herod's palace. And here's another thing you have to keep in mind. King Herod was an illegitimate king. First of all, he wasn't Jewish. And of course, any good Jew knows that the only rightful, legitimate king of Israel is someone who's from the line of King David. And so King Herod is not from the line of King David. King Herod was, was made king by the Romans, who were the occupying force at the time, right? So, so that aside, Magi come, and they say, hey, right? I give big entourage. Hey, we're here to come and worship the newborn king. And Herod's like, illegitimate king is like, whoa, wait a minute. I'm the king. What, what are you talking about? And so what does he do? What does it say there in Matthew 2? He calls the Bible experts, brothers and sisters. Verse 4, when he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them, where is the Messiah to be born? So do you, do you, see, do you see this? He called all the Bible experts in his court. These were probably the top biblical scholars of the day. And yeah, they could find the prophecy. It's actually in, in a small Old Testament book in Micah. Oh yeah, here, that prophecy in Micah says, born in Bethlehem. But then guess what? 
brothers and sisters, these Bible scholars, these doctors of biblical literature, they didn't go and worship either. These guys who knew their Bible frontwards and backwards, these guys who could find that obscure prophecy in Micah about the coming of the Messiah, the chosen one, they could find it in Scripture, but they didn't bother to find Jesus. And brothers and sisters, when we stop seeking Jesus, just like these Bible scholars and teachers of the law, they, we stop growing. And can I just say again about King Herod? Once he finds out, he doesn't go either. And so I'd like to suggest that these, 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 these biblical scholars, these teachers of the law, the chief priests and all of them, rather than seek after Jesus, what did they do? They sacrificed the wrong things. King Herod, rather than go worship Jesus too, he sacrificed the wrong things. And if I may say, what King Herod ended up sacrificing was little children. Because when you read a little bit further, right, after he figures out he's been duped by the Magi, because he told them, hey, after you go, you come back and you tell me where he is so that I may go and worship him too, which, of course, we're being told is a lie. And when he finds out that he's been duped, what does he do? A little bit further, if you were to read in verse 16, he was furious. He gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and in its vicinity who were two years old and under. So here's where I want to leave us with this. Okay, so first of all, um, knowing the word of God is important. Jesus equates it with bread. Right? We, we, need, we need bread. Um, uh, even if you have a gluten allergy, it's okay. This is, this is gluten-free bread. We need to feed regularly on the word of God. Bless you. It's so important. It really is. And, and if I may say, right, if, if you don't know uh, uh, about our, our, our church and our tradition, right, we have a very high view of Scripture. What do I mean by that? We believe that the Bible is wholly inspired by God. That over a period of thousands of years, God inspired multiple writers to come together with one unique overarching story that points to Christ. That the, that the Bible that we have today, it's infallible. It's inerrant in its original language. That's, that's what a high view of scripture means. We absolutely believe that the word of God is holy. It's, it's every, it gives us everything we need for life and godliness, right? And in fact, again, it's, it's even one of, it's one of our core values, the Bible. We need to know it. And so I want to challenge us as we enter into the new year. Will you devote yourself to studying the word of God? Not just on your own, but in community with others. Will you devote yourself to God's word? But here's the other thing that I want to challenge us to, and this is what I'm saying that I think is being told to us in this story about the chief priests and the teachers of the law, these Bible scholars that knew the, the Bible, like, you know, frontwards and backwards, but they didn't bother to go seek and worship Jesus just because you know the word doesn't mean you're growing spiritually. I remember being told once that, uh, uh, in one of my seminary classes, the seminary prof was talking about how he was being interviewed for the job, and he was posed this question, you know, who's more spiritually mature, someone who has a, doctor in biblical language, a doctorate in biblical languages or just an elderly gentleman who's been studying the word of God for decades? 
And so here's the thing, brothers and sisters. If your study of the word of God doesn't make you more like Jesus, then I would dare say you're studying it wrong. If it doesn't make you more compassionate and gracious and loving, then I would dare say you're reading it wrong. Now, don't get, don't, don't, also, don't get me wrong here, because I'm not also saying, uh, well, you know, God's, you know, the Bible says don't judge. That's always taken out of context. The Bible actually does say to judge. And, and like I said earlier, the Bible is God's, if you will, handbook for life. It does show us what's right and wrong. But again, here's the thing. High view of scripture, but I'd like to say, do you also have a wide view of God's grace and mercy? Because I tell you what, I've, I've met a lot of people who know their Bibles really well. But who would I, I would also judge, if you will, if they're not seeking after Jesus. Maybe they're just seeking after their own sort of pet doctrine. <laughs> but I want to encourage you and me today, brothers and sisters. Yes, let's be devoted to God's word. So even right now, as we're diving into the word of God, man, it is so good for us. It's so good. It can teach us things. It can show us things. Again, illuminated by the Holy Spirit of God, we can learn new things. God can speak to us. God can lead us and direct us and guide us. And just like the Magi, they needed the word of God to get them to Jesus. And same thing for you and for me, brothers and sisters. Are you devoting yourself to the word of God? And is it leading you to worship Jesus? I want to encourage you, please, you know, be, be part of, of, of studying the word of God uh, on, your, on your own and with others. It is good for you. And are you letting the Holy Spirit grow you? Here, I'll just share real quick. Forgive me. I'm probably spending more time on this than I originally wanted to, but I think it's so important. I was just speaking with someone this week, and this is what I'm talking about. Seeking Jesus and still growing in our understanding with the word of God. They were telling me about how they were, you know, they were reading scripture, and they grew up in church. And just something just struck them like never before. I love how that happens. When you read the word of God and you allow the Holy Spirit, again, to illuminate you, right? And that can just be very easy. Before you, you open up the, the, the word, you just say, you know, Holy Spirit of God, will you lead me and guide me? Right? Just simple, a simple prayer like that, a simple posture, and then you read, right? Not reading just to, to learn and to, right? Uh, but, but, but you're reading again, for illumination. You're reading for transformation. I always like to say this. Uh, don't just read the Bible. Let it read you. And so as I'm talking with this person and, and just this, you know, this verse that they had probably heard multiple times growing up in the church, it just struck them in, in, in a powerful way. And they're like, wow, I never realized that. And now, now here's the thing. This is what I'm talking about. Seeking Jesus and growing with the word of God. Then they took that, that, that revelation, if you will, and then they started to reflect of how their own life how their own life has been impacted in light of that word. Do you follow me? They were doing some self-reflection. They were doing some sort of, uh, if I may say, some, some, some uh, emotional inventory. And that's, that's exactly what I'm talking about. When you let the word of God read you, when you let the word of God seep in and say, all right, Holy Spirit, what are you showing me now? What are you revealing to me now? And it's, it, again, it's not just for intellectual stimulation and, and growth so that you can, be, you can become, you know I, know, I know everything about the Bible. No, 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 no. You're letting it grow you spiritually. And it was good. That's what I'm talking about, brothers and sisters. So I want to encourage you and me today. Let's continue to seek Jesus. And in doing so, seek him in the scriptures. You know, I'm reminded of how even Jesus, when he was talking, 
right? And, and they were always questioning him. Again, these Bible scholars were always questioning Jesus. And in John chapter 5, he talks about this, and he says, right, he says, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not accept me. But if someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. How can you believe, since you accept glory from one another, but do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Or how about in, in Matthew 23? Boy, if you were to read Matthew 23, he goes really hard on religious hypocrisy. Again, he's talking to all these Bible scholars. He's calling them a brood of vipers. Listen to one of the things he says right here. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. How about that? Brothers and sisters, the scriptures point to Jesus. And so, is your study of the word of God pointing you to Jesus? Is your study of the word of God making you more like Jesus. And again, I want, to, I, I want us to take this as a, as, a, as a serious warning because here you had, in King Herod's court, you had the quote-unquote insiders, if you will, knew their Bibles, and they didn't go to worship Jesus. So in that, I want to challenge you and me in the new year. Let's devote ourselves to the study of scripture. But then let's also devote ourselves to letting scripture work its way in us. Allowing the Holy Spirit to grow us. And that can be uncomfortable. I'm sure King Herod wasn't all too pleased. I'm sure the, 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 the teachers of the law and the chief priests were like, uh-oh. Well, brothers and sisters, that leads me to point number three. When you seek Jesus, seeking Jesus leads to worshipful sacrifice and life-altering transformation. Brothers and sisters, there is nothing better than coming to that realization to worship Jesus. I love how the story goes, right? So after they were told, now here's the thing, right? They, they first landed in Jerusalem and they're like, oh, oh yeah, okay, we got to go to Bethlehem. Uh, and also, I don't know if you've picked up on this too. This is also another kind of um, myth, if you will, that I'm dispelling. The Magi didn't show up on the night Jesus was born. Okay, so the, you know, I know all the nativity scenes. We like to have, you know, all the, you know, the Magi there too. They weren't there, sorry. <laughs> Actually, most scholars think that maybe Jesus might have been like one or two at this point. So after they go to Jerusalem and, and they find out it's in Bethlehem, did you know that that was only like a couple hours distance travel? Now I say, King Herod and the chief priests and the teachers of the law didn't even bother. But when they get there, what does it say? They were overjoyed that they found, that they found him. Verse 9, they went on their way, stopped over the place where the child was. Verse 10, when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary. And they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by an, another route. Seeking Jesus ultimately led them to a place of worshipful sacrifice. They weren't just coming to worship, right? And, and, and this is another thing that Matthew's trying to let us know. Th this is different. They weren't just coming to just sort of uh, pay respects to a king. They were worshiping him like God in the flesh. And they were giving gifts fit for a king. 
And so seeking Jesus, right, they, they had to give up. They had to give up something. Seeking Jesus leads to worshipful sacrifice and life-altering transformation. I would like to suggest that when Matthew writes that having been warned in a dream, they went home another way. And what that means is, is they actually went home on a harder road. Because if they had gone on the king's road, if you will, King Herod would have noticed. But I, I'd like to suggest that what Matthew is saying here, too, is that after you come to worship Jesus, again, and sacrifice and offering unto him, you will be changed. You won't go back home the same way. Your life will be changed. And as I look at some of you out here that I know your story, absolutely. When you come to worship Jesus, and you come to worship and sacrifice, right, a sacrifice of praise, a sacrifice of worship, a sacrifice, a living sacrifice you offer yourself, guess what? It does transform you. And so I want to challenge us today, brothers and sisters, will you come and worship Jesus? Not just as king, but as God who is worthy. Worthy of everything. Not just our praise, worthy of our whole life. Worthy of the things that we're reluctant to give. And like I said, maybe some of those are things that we need to leave behind in order to seek Jesus more fully and passionately in the new year. Will you come and worship Jesus? And let it last all of 2024. Leaving behind what you need to leave behind. Recognizing God wants you to grow. To grow. And come to a place of awe and wonder and worship. Pray with me, please. Let us pray. Worship team, come on up. Lord, we thank you for your word, which is both health and life to us. And again, this very familiar story of the Magi. Lord, we thank you for what it says to us today. And so, Holy Spirit, I trust you've already been working. And I pray that for every one of us, those things that you have brought to light that have been holding us back from seeking after you with our whole heart, I pray we would put on the altar now and say, I'm going to leave that with you, Jesus. I'm going to leave that behind. And I pray we would not pick it up again. I pray today, Lord, that we would enter the new year full, fully resolute. And say, yes, I do want to grow spiritually. I do want to enter into all that you have for me in this new year, Lord. And I pray that we would all make a fresh commitment to devoting ourselves to the word of God. Not only in print, but in person. Jesus. That we would allow you, Holy Spirit of God, to illuminate the scriptures. To point us to you. So that we would worship you. So that we would obey where you're calling us to sacrifice and surrender. And know, Lord, that when we do that, we can never go home the same way. You change us, Lord, from the inside out. You transform us. For, our, for your glory and our good. Lord, we bless you and thank you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Here, I'm willing and able, you may stand for our worship.
treasure I find, my reason for living, so let my life come an offering to the one who is worthy. I'll oh, pray. I just want to invite you, if you felt the Holy Spirit tugging on your heart, you'd like to come down and pray with me, seal the deal in worshiping the High King of Heaven today. Uh, I will be here waiting. Uh, there's also coffee hour uh, af uh, after the service, so everyone is invited to come on down to the friendship room and share in, in some, some
some refreshment and some snacks. Brothers and sisters, now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you, everyone. Happy New Year.